very small town called Bainbridge, Georgia. Um, it is very small country, southern, not much going on down there. Um, but I'll just tell y'all a little bit about like how my life was before Christ. So, like I said, I'm from Bainbridge, Georgia. My mom is a Christian. She still is a very devoted Christian. And she just taught me so much. And my dad is, um, he is from Mauritania, which is Northwest Africa. So he grew up in a Muslim household, a Muslim culture. But when he moved to America, things kind of changed. Um, his mindset, his values, his beliefs changed. So he's more on the agnostic side now. Um, and during my parents' marriage, like you can already see this tension of like being unequally yoked. Um, but I didn't really know a lot about what that meant. Um, so my uh, my mom like really just taught me so much about like Christianity. I was exposed to Christianity through her. Um, she would take me to church. I grew up in the church. I was always at vacation Bible school. Always like going to Sunday school. So like I was I was in the church. So you think that everything was perfect? It was not. <laughs> When I was around five or six, my parents got divorced, and I just wasn't very, I couldn't understand what that meant at that age, and I was just like, you know, like, what is going on? Why is he, like, not in the house anymore? And growing up, I was very close to my mom, very, I just gravitated towards her a lot more, and I didn't dislike my dad, we just weren't very close, and when the divorce happened, I mean, there were a lot of things that led up to that, but when it happened, um, I had to get used to going to like two different households. So like, for example, half of the summer I was spending it with my dad and then the other half I was spending it with my mom. And it was just a very hard thing to like understand at that age. Um, but I started to notice like a lot of anger in my dad at a very un a young age. And to this day, I don't really understand like where the root of it came from. I don't know what happened in his childhood to for him to have, to have so much anger and bitterness and hatred in his heart. But when that divorce happened, that anger amplified. It got bigger. And my mom was not going to deal with it. They were divorced. His new girlfriend at the time wasn't really going to deal with that either. And I'm sure he didn't want to like show that side of him to her in this new fresh relationship. So then here I am as like a five or six year old child, very degrading, very hurtful. Um, so in middle school, I started to develop hate, bitterness at a young age. I was only like 10. Like a 10 year old shouldn't have these types of feelings. And as I got older, when I hit high school, this hate turned into rage, just like a deep bitterness, a deep rage. And mind you, I was in the church. I was just going to church normally, like on the outside, you would have never seen this because I didn't really express it. Mm. Um, so my, like I said, when I was in high school, all this deep anger and rage that I had, I suppressed it. Of course, I like, told my mom, and my mom was there. Like she helped me out so much and she was like, you know, this is how he is, don't let him like scare you. But I I'm, I was so sensitive and weak, so I allowed these things to scare me. And in high school, that rage and that bitterness just got worse. And it, got, it really got so bad to the point where I, I would have these mindsets of if something was to happen to my dad, if he was to die, I would not care. I would not care because I, I wanted a new dad. I was like, why do I have to get this dad? I was so jealous. I was I had a lot of envy in my heart. Um, because my friends, like they have like two parents in the house. I'm like, I want that. Why can't I have that? And it, it was just like this deep hurt that I had. And like a lot of people, when we don't turn to God, when we don't we don't turn to Christ for um, help and comfort. We turn to other things. So when I was eight, I was exposed to pornography and it actually happened at my dad's house. Mm. And it was kind of my fault. I was always told to not look in, in a certain place in his room and I looked in that certain place and found those, those DVDs. 
And I just watched them and didn't understand what I was watching at that age, but it sparked a curi a, like my curious mind. So by the time I was 10, I was fully hooked. I was like, I knew what it was. I knew what pornography was. I watched it. I understood it. And at that age, I was, I had so much access to so much technology. I had a, a phone, an iPod, a laptop, computer at home, and these things were for school. But I was also using them for other things too. And in middle school, I didn't, I understood why I was watching it. Like it was interesting, it was different. But even though I couldn't fully comprehend it, I was just watching it. It was entertaining. And then when I hit high school, it started to take root as something deeper. It was an emotional comfort. It was mm. something that I found just, it was an escape, really. Mm. It was something that I could just go to when I was sad or angry. And then by the time I hit college, pornography had rooted itself so deep into my heart that I turned to that before I even turned to God. And you would think, like, these are just videos. How are you turning to videos before you turn to God? And that's how blinded I was. And I was in college at Georgia State, and I was very depressed. I was still angry. I was walking around with a lot of hate, a lot of bitterness. And like I said, I was still in the church. Hmm. I was still come to church. Like, in high school, I was in the FCA, and... In college, I was going to the BCM meetings. I was playing in the orchestra. I was doing these things, hiding behind who I actually was behind closed doors. And by the time I, like last year, February, I was at the end of myself, really. I was only 21 and I was just like, I don't understand what this is. This had become such a deep rooted thing in my heart. Like I didn't even think it was possible to live a, a life outside of pornography, outside mm. of hate, outside of, of unforgiveness. So mm. sorry. Um, on, girl, be free. Please. I was only 21 and I was like about to just start looking into that whole culture of like casual dating, hookups, having friends with benefits, because that's what that was supposed to, that's what the kids are doing. Like, that's what people my age are doing. And I had friends who did it, and I was like, you know what, porn isn't enough. And I was about to step foot into that lifestyle. I was scared. I didn't know like what could happen, like a lot of different things could happen, and I was terrified, but I was like, you know what, this is not enough. Mm. And I had stopped going to church a little bit, and by this time, it's February of last year, and I just decided to go to church one Sunday, and Carrie Skinner was there, and he was preaching on repentance. Like I said, I grew up in the church, but I didn't understand what repentance was. I didn't understand the gospel. I didn't understand like the, the simple things, bearing fruit, what was that? I don't know. And, and another key thing that I did not mention, so when I was 15, I got baptized, but it was a very insincere decision hmm. because I only did it because I saw other people my age doing it. And I was like, oh, maybe I should get baptized. Maybe things could change. And I thought baptism was what saved you. Hmm. So I got baptized with no clear knowledge of what baptism was. But I lied to myself. My mom was like, are you sure you, you want to make this decision? I'm like, yes, I know what I'm doing. And I was living in a life of deception. I deceived myself. I lied to myself. Um, so when I got baptized, nothing changed. If anything, I got worse. And that right there shows you like there was no true encounter with Christ because my heart was still in the same place. Mm. Um, so going back to February, uh, I went to church that one Sunday and Carrie Skinner was preaching on repentance. And something that day, it like it clicked. It made sense. And I was like, what? Like, 
this actually makes a lot of sense. And I begin to feel the weight of my sin. Mm -hmm. And when I say feel the weight, I felt the weight. I felt like something was crushing me that day. And I just felt very like closed in. And like my immediate response was like, I really need to tell somebody about this. And Miss Darling, I she's been there before, like all of this. So I, I actually did talk to her about it, but I think back then I wasn't very serious about changing. Hmm. I was still holding on to that. That was the only thing that I knew. So when I heard that, that sermon on repentance, it made sense. And I remember going to talk with um, Pastor T and Mr. Chris. And my, my intentions, I went in here to, to meet them, to talk to them about how can I get like practical steps to stop watching pornography. And I remember T said this so clearly, he was like, your porn addiction is not going to go anywhere until you forgive your dad. I said, what? I came in here for practical advice on how to stop watching porn. What does my dad have to do with that? He has nothing to do with that. He's like, that has everything to do with that. And I remember he showed me the gospel using the three circles. And that it was the first time that the gospel made sense. It clicked. I understood it. And T asked me that question, like, on a scale of zero to 100%, what is your percentage? Like, what do you, what percentage do you think is going to get you to heaven? And I was like, right now I'm at like a sixty. I don't, I don't know. It could go both ways. And for me to say that as someone who grew up in the church, like that's, that's a little terrifying. And after that, like I remember just once again feeling the weight of my sin. I felt that in that room, and I remember just crying out to God, like, God, I'm sorry. Mm. Like, I've really been living a life of deception. I've been living to like, trying to walk in the spirit, but then I'm also trying to walk in the flesh, and you can't do both. You cannot do both of those, oh. and I remember just crying out, and like, mm. for the first time, when I was done praying, like, I felt this weight just, disappear. And I knew in that room something was different. Something changed that day. Mm. And immediately after that, I began to be like discipled by Pastor T, Ms. Cress, and Stacey Edmond. And they, I would meet with these three people weekly. And they will all tell me, they will all tell me the same message. And it's coming out of Matthew 6, 14 through 15. And it says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Hmm. And they all told me this. Now, they didn't know that they were telling me the same exact thing. But it was like, when we hear a, a verse or a message over and over, God is like trying to get you to focus on something. Hmm. And I remember, I was still scared. Like, I didn't want to forgive him. I was holding on to that. I blamed every inconvenience in my life on him. I blamed the way I was on him. And when I got saved in that room, something changed. My heart changed that day. And it wasn't just like, oh, just, it'll be, I'll be the same person today, and then I'll be a different person tomorrow. Like, no, something changed. Mm -hmm. And then I got baptized in March, and it was a very sincere decision. And I remember how fast God was working in my life. So when April, by the time April last year came, I remember waking up one morning, and I was like, I need to forgive my dad. I need to let these things go. And I remember I called Pastor T, and I was just bawling. I was crying. I was like, T, I think mean, today I really just need to let this go. I need to make that dreaded phone call to my dad. And he remembers this. Like, I was crying. I was so scared. I was like, but I don't want to do this. I can't do this. I, I don't know what to say, and I don't know what to do, and I don't know what a life looks, out, a life looks like outside of that grudge. I don't know. But he told me, he 
took me to verse, um, he took me to Exodus. Exodus 14, 3 through 4. It says, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And I rested in that. I only needed to be still. I only needed to say yes and amen. I only needed to say yes and I will follow you, God. Mm. I didn't know what that was going to look like, but I said yes. Mm. And I called my dad. And mind you, I was like, I hope he does not pick up the phone. Like, you're not going to pick up the phone today. Not today. He picked up on the first ring. So I was like, oh, okay, this, this is happening today. Um, so I, I immediately was just like, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for the way I've been treating you and the attitude that I had towards you, that hey, I'm sorry that I did that to you. And I asked him, I asked him to forgive me. And he said, well, why are you asking me to forgive you when I was the one who hurt you? Mm. And by the end of that phone call, my dad, who barely believes there is a God, was saying like, I have never seen this type of love before. What is this? I have never seen this type of forgiveness. What is this? And we were just both crying. Now that phone call was only 10 minutes, but it set me free from over like almost 10 years of bondage mm. to unforgiveness. Hey, Come on. Pride, anger, Come on. It's a lot of different things. And mm. God has just been showing me so much in my life since then. Um, he's just been working every day. God has been bringing me so many people like Pastor T, Miss Stacy, um, Darlene, my mom, like just so many people who I can just share life with and so many young women that I can do life with and they can teach me and, and guide me. But I think one of the most helpful things this church ever did for me was disciple me. I didn't know what discipleship was, and I grew up in the church. And when I got baptized the first time, nobody really discipled me. Hmm. But I also didn't make a sincere decision back then either. Mm -hmm. So I'm just so thankful that God has gotten a hold of me at 22. Because there's so many crazy things that a 22-year-old can get into these days. And I'm just so excited for what he has in store for me. Um, and I'll just share like a few things that God has just really been blessing me with. So I have not watched any type of pornography in like a year. Come on. And Come on. That alone, I used to go and try to quit on my own. And I would stop watching for like two weeks. And then something bad would happen, or I'll get stressed out, and I'll go right back to it. Mm. But I now, when things get hard, I go to God. Mm. I go to His Word. I go to His truth because I know that's what set me free, not pornography. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't walk around with that bitter, that hateful heart anymore. I can see my dad in a different light, mm. a different positive perspective that I have never been able to look at him from, and I know that's only from God. And my dad has showed signs of change. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> this is the same guy that used to cuss me out? He was like texting me the other, the other day and just us having a conversation is so different. It's so weird, like I'm not used to it. And um, my, so he, you know, he, helped me, he helped me get a new phone. And he was texting my mom, um, because my mom texted him like, hey, thanks for helping her get the phone. And my dad said, thanks for raising a great daughter. Mm. What? <laughs> my mom was just staring at the phone like, is this the same guy? And I was like, I guess. I don't know what's really going on, but he's just been showing small signs of change. And I just asked that he could just pray that maybe God is working in his life. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just...
close with a few verses that really just stuck out to me, a few verses that just have been branded almost in my head. So the first one is 2 Corinthians 11.3, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent be guilty through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity mm. that is in Christ. Mm. We always miss the simplicity. It's so simple. Repentance, belief, putting your focus on God, we miss it. Mm. The second verse is um, Exodus 14, 13 through 14. Uh, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Galatians 1.10, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Wow. And then the last one is Romans 3, 22 through 24. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came from Christ Jesus. He didn't say you were redeemed from your work. When you trying to please God with your work. Look, here's my religious resume, y'all. I'm at the church every Sunday. I'm saved. No. Like, you are saved through faith, through grace, through mercy that Christ has had on you. Mm. Um, and these last few things have just really made an impact on me as well. So I've learned that a true encounter with God will not leave you and your heart looking the same. Mm. If you've had a true encounter with God, your life should reflect that. It shouldn't look the same as it did before God. The Christian life is not boring, and it's not about having a bunch of rules um, from stopping you from having fun. Hmm. Through right. my new relationship with Christ, I've learned to love the law because the law exposes my heart. It tells me what's really in my heart. And I, through knowing that, I can repent, and I can grow, and I can understand that this is sin. I can recognize my sin. And biblical counseling and a heart of the problem has really helped me understand what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And I just want to continue my walk with God and share his truth to others because there is power in his name. Mm -hmm. And I have seen him work tremendously in my life. Mm -hmm. So thank y'all so much for just letting me get up here and share my story. And I would love to close y'all in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for just giving me the strength to come up here and just share your word with all these great people. Lord, I pray that someone's heart was touched tonight. Um, I pray that they don't just sit here and just wallow in their sin. Lord, if you are here, you are present, and I know you're, you're, you're truth, Lord, I pray that you touch somebody's heart, and I pray that they confess that unto you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you just teach every one of us what repentance looks like. Mm. I pray that you teach us that it is a change of mind. It is a change of direction. It is a, it is us saying that, God, I'm sorry, I sinned, I am wrong. Mm. I ask that you just cleanse my heart and empower me so that I can go out here and live for you and not live for this world. Lord, we love you so much. And um, <coughs> Lord, thank you for just... Thank you for giving everybody in your life today. Thank you for allowing us to get up and walk and just talk. Lord, I pray if anybody's struggling with anything, I pray that they just come to this altar right now, Lord, and they just they just lay all that on you. Lord, we love you so much, and I pray all of these great things in your holy and gracious name. Amen. Amen.